give the first talk of term. Um, we're very lucky to have Colin Bruce, who's been a member of SISOP for many years now, and he's going to give us a talk. Um, he's written many popular science books, which have been translated into over a dozen languages, and he's also done research with the European Space Agency and MOD. Um, he's not associated with any of the large fusion reactors, so he's come here to give you an unbiased opinion on, on what he thinks is the way forward for fusion. And so, we, can everyone join me in welcoming the speaker, Colin? Thank you. Well, I'm old enough, and I think one of you are too, to remember a couple of times in my lifetime, fusion had supposedly been solved. There was the cold fusion fiasco with Fleischmann and Pons, which everybody was a bit suspicious of. But there have been a couple of other occasions when it really had looked like there was a breakthrough and circumstances had conspired to de deceive the scientists and no fusion wasn't quite here yet. And it's pretty tantalizing because the universe is kind of thumbing its nose at us over this because fusion has been going on all over the universe ever since the Big Bang in the entities we call stars. So the universe doesn't find it very difficult. So why is it so hard for us? So, I'll start with something very basic, and since we're a relatively select group tonight, do please, if there's anything that somebody doesn't understand, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt with a question. But starting with very basics, you know that there is far more energy to be had from fiddling with the nucleus than there is chemical bond energy. Now, being somebody keen on spaceflight, I like to think of it in terms of rocket exhaust speeds. The best chemicals we have as a rocket fuel have enough energy to propel themselves at about five kilometers per second. On the other hand, the best nuclear fuel we have, which would be deuterium and tritium, the tiny fraction, really, of the rest mass energy which is released, the nuclear binding energy, would be enough to take the exhaust of such a rocket to 26,000 kilometers per second. So there is many, many millions of times more energy per kilogram to be had from nu the nucleus than from chemical bombs. But it's been a very long pursuit. There's an infamous quote, how many of you have heard it? That power will be too cheap to meter once we get nuclear power solved. Now that, no, nobody, it's a very long time ago, but, and very discredited obviously, but that was actually said about fusion, not fission. And it's been pursued since before World War II, even. Rather spookily, there was a guy with the wonderful name of Philo Farnsworth. You couldn't get better than the Farnsworth Fuser. It sounds out of a science fiction novel, but it was for real. He worked on early television. And he knew John Logie Baird, for example, who worked on the very first mechanical television. And Philo Farnsworth was always interested in television because a cathode ray tube is very similar to the arrangement you could use to accelerate ions, which can result in fusion. And after World War II, he actually got a US government grant to develop essentially television technology, the cathode ray tube, to see if he could do fusion with it. But for a 75-year quest that's had tens of billions of dollars spent on it, progress has been very modest. And I should also say, by the way, tongue-in-cheek, I try to make my talks provocative, and one of my faint hopes is, after I've been saying how simple there must be an easy way, that somebody in the audience will one day raise their hands and say, I've got it, and finally point out the way to do fusion on a desktop. For real. Possibly. But we really should have got a bit further, because fusion, it's not one of these quests that we could find out 100 years from now, or 200, and it wouldn't really make much difference to the human race. Many people think that our current economic stagnation in the West, and it may be a bit of a shock, you're probably most scientists rather than economists, but we now have, I sound very hypocritical as a science writer saying this, we have a popular science industry geared to telling everybody that scientists are doing wonderful things, they found the Higgs boson or whatever. There's an economist written book called Stagnation, which has dared to point out that actually it's been a very long time since science really did anything new and spectacular 
for us, like fusion, like cheap space travel, like a general cure for cancer, those things that have become almost wistful goals. If we got good clean fusion, it would certainly be the finish of the greenhouse effect. We could stop burning coal tomorrow and we could do a whole lot more. Yes, Roy? Um, this book that you just mentioned, sorry, uh, what was the name? Uh, it's called Just Stagnation. I don't remember the name of the author at this instant. Now, here is our basic map for if you want to get energy out of the atomic nucleus from fission or from fusion. The key point to note is, about a quarter of the way along the periodic table, the most tightly bound nucleus is the isotope of iron that you see up there. Almost as tightly bound is an isotope of nickel. Do you recall that the core of the Earth is made out of nickel and iron? That is not coincidence. In fusion burn, the ultimate ash you get, like when everything has burned up as a supernova, is nickel and iron. That's what everything is ultimately heading towards. This is pretty good news for getting energy from fusion, because it means any other elements, lighter or heavier, potentially you can get energy by letting them converge on that key weight. So you can do fission of heavy elements like obviously uranium, split them in part to get towards that energy peak, or you can take light elements and you can combine them. Now, you don't need to be an expert in reading graphs to see there's a lot more energy to be got out of combining light elements than there is to be got out of splitting heavy elements. What's more, there's a lot more light elements around. We're never going to run out of hydrogen, whereas uranium is harder to come by. So why do we actually do fission? Well, actually, it's because it's as easy as falling off a log. Never believe a physicist or engineer who tells you they're being really clever. People go for the easiest solution. And splitting uranium isn't very hard because it actually busts a part of its own accord, even U-238, though U-235 has a shorter half-life. So fission is so easy to do, you can do it. I'd be quite curious how many people knew this. You don't even have to refine your uranium to increase the percentage of U-235. The very first squash court reactor back in World War II was made by stacking bricks of natural isotope composition uranium with blocks of graphite which acted as moderators and slowed down the neutrons given off so that the neutrons from the natural splitting cause more uranium atoms to split and so on. And there is one kind of reactor we still use today that doesn't require uranium to be enhanced in its U-235 content, and that is in Canada, the CANDU reactors use very, very pure heavy water as their working fluid and as their moderator, and that heavy water slows down neutrons without absorbing them, or without absorbing more than a very tiny number, so that a CANDU reactor can run off unenriched uranium, although it does work better off enriched. And we're not going to run out of uranium, it's not terribly plentiful, but in the sea there is dissolved 5 billion tonnes of it. And there have been experiments at pilot plant scale to extract uranium from the sea. At the moment it's still more expensive than from the cheapest mines, but it would be well worth economically doing if that was how we had to get our energy. So why not? Why don't we just stick with fission if fission is so easy? Well, you probably know the reason. It's because you cannot get away from nasty byproducts. When uranium splits, it produces quite a lot of plutonium. In fact, many different isotopes of plutonium, which have different half-lives, all in the nasty range. They're short enough that the radioactivity is considerable, and they're not so short that it all decays away in time to make the way safe during a human lifetime, say. So burning uranium, it cannot be done cleanly. You get plutonium. Thorium is sometimes touted, it's the other alternative to uranium up at the top of the periodic table. Uh, 
Thorium is cleaner, but one of the things it breaks down to is uranium-233, which is really nasty stuff. There is a danger both of proliferation, because if you had nuclear reactors all over the world, if they're producing stuff terrorists can use for an atom bomb, this is not good. Nor is it good if you get large amounts of nuclear waste resulting from accidents. So really, everybody would greatly prefer not to use uranium or thorium if there is a better alternative, and there certainly is. Let me flip back to that graph for a moment and point out some a detail from this end. Do you see that helium, ordinary everyday helium, is really anomalously high up? So that means we can get a lot of energy just out of combining some isotopes of hydrogen into helium. We don't have to go all the way to that peak in the middle. There's another very curious feature that is going to turn out to be vitally useful to us. Do you see how lithium occupies a little dip in the graph? That turns out to be the key to doing practical reactors in our lifetime. So, why is fusion harder than fission? Well, I think you, again, probably know the basic reason. To do fusion, you have to make atomic nuclei collide together. Atomic nuclei contain protons and repel one another very, very strongly, so you have to collide them together at considerable speed. It does not happen spontaneously like fission of uranium. Now, if you put it in degrees, this, these are obviously order of magnitude figures, it varies with various factors, um, it, it sounds a bit intimidating. 100 million degrees you will not get in your kitchen. It sounds less intimidating if you put it in terms of a speed of the order of 1,000 kilometers a second your nuclei need to move at, which is very slow compared to, say, an electron in a particle accelerator. And it sounds really non-intimidating if you put it in electron volts. How big a voltage do you need to accelerate your nuclei to a speed where some of them will fuse? Only 10,000 volts. Now, that, that may sound a little high compared to 250 domestic, but to an electrical engineer, 10,000 volts is nothing, and that's what Farnsworth was keen about, because in an old-fashioned television set cathode ray tube, you get easily that kind of voltage available. So it is, in a sense, trivially easy to accelerate nuclei to the point where they'll collide with other nuclei and fuse. They did it in the Cavendish Laboratory and other places about 100 years ago, and those designs you see on the internet for doing fusion in your basement, or everybody must have seen these headlines, young boy does fusion in his basement with a design off the internet, it's really true, sort of. The problem, of course, is that to do the kind of fusion you get net energy out of is much harder. Because atomic nuclei are tiny things. Supposing I use an electric gun to fire ions at a block of light material at the right speed, I will detect the occasional fusion event. I'll detect the occasional neutron. But that's only when an ion just happens to hit a nucleus pretty soon after it enters the block of solid material. Since the nucleus is so tiny, the vast majority of ions will just be going through the space in between the nuclei, and they will be losing energy by interacting with the electrons in an effect called bremsstrahlung. So the vast majority of the ions will just slow down and stop without giving you anything useful out. So this kind of fusion is a method of putting energy into something, not getting energy out. So, since the atomic nuclei are so tiny, how can we make enough collisions take place? We must do some form of confinement. We must somehow hold these very, very fast-moving nuclei together for a significant period of time for there to be a chance for a lot of collisions between them to take place. We've had to invest a lot of energy to do this because of a phenomenon called equipartition of energy. The electrons, which are inevitably present in solid matter, take up a lot of the energy. The electrons move faster. Roughly, each freely moving particle has the same amount of kinetic energy, which means the much lighter electrons are moving much faster than the nuclei, even though it's the nuclei we want to move. 
A second major practical problem is the vast majority, almost all, of the fusion reactions that might can come in handy for us produce neutrons. And neutrons are very difficult to shield against, and they tend to make things they hit radioactive. So what we need is a kind of fusion that doesn't produce unwanted neutrons, and yet the temperature at which it happens is not so high that somehow we can contain the matter for long enough for a lot of internucleus collisions to take place. And that turns out to be really, really hard. Fortunately, there is a tantalizing menu of options available. Indeed, this graph is a bit deceptive. I won't go through all the curves, but you see DT up at the top. That curve is telling us that deuterium and tritium, where ordinary hydrogen, the nucleus is just a proton, deuterium, the nucleus is a proton plus a neutron, heavy water, Ordinary water has a percentage of deuterium in, and it's not terribly difficult by distillation or by cleverer methods to get the deuterium refined out. Tritium is harder. There isn't any natural tritium around on Earth, or none to speak of, but I'll come back to that in a moment. If we could use the deuterium-tritium reaction, well, something you can't see from this graph but is also true, it produces much more energy than the other fusion reactions whose curves are shown on there. So it's a relatively little energy in because it starts to happen at low kinetic energies, low temperatures, and a lot of energy out. All the other reactions we might use listed on there require temperatures at least 10 times or so as high. And since getting a fusion reactor hot enough to get even deuterium-tritium fusion has so far baffled the world, you can imagine that trying for a temperature 10 times higher still is a bit daunting. Why would we even bother? Well, it's that goal of clean fusion, fusion that doesn't produce any neutrons. Have any of you heard about the great promise of deuterium-helium-3 fusion? which for a long time people did kind of believe in. And as a science fiction reader, I love the idea, because there's no helium-3 on Earth, but there is in the solar wind, so there is in the lunar topsoil. So if you want an excuse to go and mine something on the moon, and mining most things on the moon would make no economic sense whatever, but if this were true, then it would be worth going to the moon to harvest the helium-3 to bring back for clean fusion reactors. There's an embarrassingly elementary error there, however. You probably noticed during your GCSE chemistry that when you heat up a test tube full of chemicals, unfortunately, it's not just the particular reaction you happen to be interested in that occurs. All the reactions that are physically called for occur. And in this case, if you heat up, or the equivalent, helium-3 with deuterium, of course, the deuterium atoms are also, nuclear, also colliding into one another occasionally. So deuterium-deuterium fusion happens too, and that is very messy and produces neutrons. The only truly a neutronic, just about, the only clean fusion available is protons, hydrogen nuclei, with boron-11. That requires fiercely high temperatures. Moreover, it doesn't actually produce much energy. I don't know how many of you were at the talk last term where we heard from somebody who is really devoted to getting proton-boron fusion to work. But it's incredibly hard. He had to assume he would get a very high percentage fuel burn, and he had to assume he'd get an incredibly high efficiency of converting the energy into electricity. So I, I would love to think it would work, but I wouldn't bet on it. So what I'm getting at is we probably have to use deuterium and tritium for all its faults. Easiest, produces most energy. And I mentioned the others, not so good. This is why we should be so grateful that the universe gave us lithium. You will occasionally, or more than occasionally, actually, if you live around here, hear fusion engineers grumble, plasma is so badly behaved, it's as if the gods didn't want us to have fusion. 
Actually, I'll come in a moment, I don't think it's so amazing plasma is badly behaved, but actually it's the opposite. We live in a really spooky universe for there to be something as helpful as lithium around. Lithium is effectively the only light element that will undergo fission and release energy. So supposing we're fusing some deuterium and tritium, it will spray out these unwanted, quote unquote, neutrons. But if we can surround the explosion site completely with lithium, well, lithium is light enough it acts as its own moderator, so the neutrons will slow down, bouncing off initial nuclei. Lithium-6 can capture a neutron and turn into tritium, with also an alpha particle, and release energy in so doing. So surrounding your fusion site with lithium-6, you can, in principle, capture every neutron that comes off and get extra energy and make another tritium. So if you keep purifying your tritium out of your lithium, you can close the cycle. Or can you quite? Nothing is 100% efficient. Isn't that a bit of a snag? If each, fi if each fusion gives you one neutron, gives you almost always a tritium again, but not quite always, there's a gap. Well, no, nature has been even kinder than that. Lithium actually comes in two natural isotopes. Lithium-6 behaves, as I just said, and turns into tritium. Lithium-7, however, can capture a high-energy neutron and turn into tritium and release another neutron, which can go on to catalyze the formation of another tritium. So just by juggling the ratio of lithium-6 to lithium-7 in the melt that you surround your reaction site with, you can control exactly how much tritium you get. You can turn the production up if you're wanting to make more fusion reactors, or you can turn it down if you're getting an embarrassing amount of tritium, or you can keep the cycle exactly perfectly closed. No surplus neutrons, no surplus radioactive stuff. Lithium, it almost feels like nature is being too generous. It has a low melting point, a high boiling point, a high heat capacity. So using the lithium as the working fluid for your reactor, circulating it to take the heat away, works brilliantly. Even better than that, lithium has a very, very low vapor pressure. Most liquids exposed to vacuum tend to spontaneously boil. Lithium has a tiny vapor pressure. So keeping a lot of liquid lithium is compatible with keeping a high vacuum in the vicinity. Downside, you need about one meter thickness equivalent of liquid or solid lithium, roughly, surrounding the reaction if you want a higher a longer thing in praise of uh, lithium. The New Scientist published a letter of mine on the 26th of April, which is a kind of hymn to lithium. Uh, so if you wish to read about all the incredible bounties more are listed in there. So deuterium tritium will do if we can surround the reaction site with lithium, which is not a given. The hard thing we have still to do, however, is to confine the deuterium and tritium together for long enough that a decent number of internuclear collisions have a chance to take place, so a good percentage of this fuel will actually fuse together. Farnsworth, the guy of the Farnsworth fuser and the early television set, was hoping to do everything with electric fields, and that's not really practical for reasons I can explain in more detail in questions if anybody is curious. What does work as magnetic fields, because in a plasma, in a high temperature plasma, the positively charged nuclei and negatively charged electrons are moving independently. So an electric field tends to pull them in opposite directions. But a magnetic field, if I'm a positively charged, and here, um, if I was talking in a high school, I would do a really embarrassing kind of disco demonstration. But if we have a magnetic field, imagine magnetic field lines are coming down vertically through this room, then if I'm a positively charged particle, I will tend to orbit, clockwise, say, if I am a negatively charged particle, I will tend to orbit anti-clockwise. But even though everybody is doing their own thing, we're all staying in broadly the same place on the dance floor. So a magnetic field can confine all of a plasma in place.
You do need a strong magnetic field, but then nature has given us superconductors. So one method of confinement is a magnetic bottle. The other method is simply inertia. If you need a lot of collisions, we've all experienced at rush hour, if you just stuff a lot of people into too small a space, and they're all trying to rush somewhere, you get plenty of collisions. So the second method is just to squeeze matter together to a far higher density than it normally achieves, something of the order of hundreds of grams per cubic centimeter. And then you get so many collisions that even though the fuel will explode outward very quickly in mere picoseconds, you'll still have had enough collisions that a good percentage of your fuel has reacted. Those are the two methods. So here's step one, how do I get magnetic confinement? Well, a solenoid will stop charged particles leaking out sideways, but it's open at the ends. They can escape at the ends. Genius. Well, the Russians thought of it first. A tokamak, you simply take a solenoid and bend it into a ring shape. So now it has no ends, and although there are various subtleties and complications, a tokamak, a solenoid bent in a circle, can confine a plasma pretty effectively. And for some decades, a tokamak was the leading method of doing fusion. And th there's a wonderful book called Lasers Above the Cherry Orchards, you might have seen in Black Wars, written by a guy from Britain, one of a team, who the Soviets invited over at the height of a co the Cold War because they were convinced they'd done fusion in a tokamak. And they needed an international team to verify it. And circumstances deceived everybody. So for a few days, the world really believed we'd got fusion, but no factors had conspired to make them believe they were getting a higher temperature than they were. Tokamaks are very, very hard to really make work. It's often ascribed to plasma instability, although the word instability is used a bit loosely to mean really any time the plasma does something you don't want it to do. The number of instabilities keeps growing. I just take Wikipedia. There are currently 60 separate instabilities of plasma listed on Wikipedia. A fusion engineer will laugh at you if you say this and say he or she knows of hundreds. It depends exactly how you count them. And there are literally hundreds of different designs of tokamak have been built, each one of which yields the lesson you need to build a bigger and a more expensive one if you really want this lot to work. Now, fusion engineers do grumble about how unreasonable it is that plasma behaves in this unexpected way. Let me give you an analogy. I don't think it is so unreasonable. Imagine you were an alien living on a planet with no liquids or gases, no fluids. And you were told about the possibility of liquids and gases in a theoretical kind of way. You would visualize a really simple planet with a layer of liquid and above it a layer of gas just sitting there. Now, you're laughing because you live on the Earth, which has liquid and gas, and some of you may personally have experienced or seen things like tornadoes, hurricanes, there is Coriolis force. The atmosphere is anything but still. It has dozens of instabilities. Now, a plasma has more opportunities to misbehave than an ordinary gas. Two of them are a plasma conducts electricity, so you can get electric currents flowing around on a big scale. And a plasma is so hot that because of the fourth power radiation law, it can transmit considerable amounts of energy can be transferred from one piece of the plasma to another by radiation alone. So you'd expect a plasma to behave in a more complicated way than the fluids we are familiar with. So that keeps happening. They keep building tokamaks bigger and bigger. This is the ITA one. It's going to have, I think, 20,000 tons of metal. It is going to be something like the size and weight of a battleship, but far, far more costly, tens of billions of dollars. I really don't think, you know, and there are good reasons people working on these things know there are unsolved engineering problems, even if you got that working. A second alternative is inertial confinement. This can you just squeeze things together. 
and get enough collisions. This is the favorite method currently being pursued, invented by a guy called Knuckles. The idea is that you take a sphere of deuterium tritium, well, deuterium tritium gas, surround it with a layer of deuterium tritium ice, very, very cold, even hydrogen will freeze. Surround that with a layer of more or less anything, we call it an ablator, which might even be plastic or beryllium. Now you fire lasers at this poor little spherical pellet from every direction. A bit like one of these Tom and Jerry movies where, you know, one poor mouse surrounded by angry cats. You fire a ridiculous number of lasers at this pellet. It causes material to evaporate from all over the outer surface, which by rocket effect, by conservation of momentum, drives the inner part inward at very high speed. You need, in fact, of the order of a few hundred kilometers a second. As the ice rushes inwards, well, it comes towards the middle and it gets denser, but the clever bit was having a little bit of DT gas in the middle, because that gets compressed by a much bigger factor, and therefore it heats up much more. Because to get fusion, we need, first of all, very, very dense fuel, but we also need a hot point, just like you do to light a fire. So this gas surrounded by a layer of DT ice, that gives us a central hot point and very dense fuel around it, and that, of course, is what they've been trying to do in the National Ignition Facility. You can probably see the difficult bit. In an area where instabilities have always been the problem, well, in a sense, if you do stuff very fast, at least you've got less time for instabilities to grow and become pathological. But it doesn't mean you get rid of all possible instabilities. And the, still, the only one you really have to worry about in various variants is one called a Raleigh-Taylor instability, which, funnily enough, for coincidental reasons, has been familiar to the human race for a very long time. The problem with trying to compress a sphere and have it remain a perfect sphere is you've got layers of different density and the denser stuff wants to get through the less dense stuff. Similarly, in the sea, um, this actually happens when a layer of ice forms in the Arctic. The ice squeezes the salt out. Just below the ice, you get a layer of very, very dense cold salty water, which is actually denser than the fresher water underneath it which is obviously an unstable situation, denser above less dense. But initially, it's a kind of neutral stability. It's like balancing a pencil perfectly on its tip. It doesn't know which way to fall. But as soon as you get some of the cold stuff bulging downward, then it tends to rush down fast. This is the coolest photograph of a Raleigh-Taylor instability ever. It was taken by a BBC Nature team. This is, in the Arctic, a kind of Raleigh-Taylor instability on steroids. What you can get is the cold, salty water plunges down and actually freezes a sheath of freshwater ice around it. And if you're a poor old starfish living on the sea bottom, it must be very like the wrath of God striking you, because this comes shooting downwards, this spike, and kills you if it strikes you. So that's the kind of instability, denser stuff passing through less dense, that if you don't make your collapsing sphere very, very spherical, and it's even more difficult if you're trying to get a thin layer of stuff um, collapsing around a gas, this makes it difficult. In the National Ignition Facility, they use a hole ram to make sure that they heat their sphere very evenly and it collapses very evenly. I can give you a simple pop sci analogy. I will put here a slice of bread. I would like you to toast it on one side by all firing the little laser pointers you have on you at it. It won't get very evenly browned obviously. If, on the other hand, I put the bread here and asked you to shine your lasers at the blackboard behind it, now the blackboard would get warm. And even if your lasers are not perfectly pointed and are wobbling about at random and so on, the bread will actually toast quite evenly. That's essentially what a whole ram does. You illuminate the inside. The inside gets very hot. You hope your sphere collapses perfectly. You need a lot of lasers. This is the National Ignition Facility. It doesn't really have three football fields on top of it. Somebody photoshopped those in so you get the sense of scale. It's the size of an aircraft carrier in order to make a fuel capsule almost too small to see. 
collapse and produce a rather modest amount of energy. It really is an enterprise on a ridiculous scale. I'm only going to give you a flavour of these. Um, I had uh, yep, for, there are one or two first years here. Try not to be too shocked if you thought that the world always ran in an orderly and well-balanced fashion. Um, it doesn't run very well. When peer review fails, there were people who knew decades ago that the National Ignition Facility was going to fail. It actually fell short of ignition point by a factor of several, which is really quite unusual for engineering nowadays. You know, they, you don't fly a jumbo jet having worked out the wing strength carefully and find the wings fall off because you'd misestimated by a factor of several. It's fairly shocking. I won't try and go through the details, um, but way back, long before they built the National Ignition facility, they were still testing atom bombs, and somebody had the clever idea if you pipe off x rays from an atom bomb you're testing, you could test, you could get a flash of x rays to see whether this method of fusion inertial confinement will work. And they knew apparently from those days, though initially it was very highly classified, as H-bomb tests tend to be, that the computer code called LASNEX, which is the main one they use in the National Ignition Facility, they knew it was inaccurate in these regimes. They knew it took more like 20 megajoules of energy absorbed by the capsule, more than an order of magnitude, more than the National Ignition Facility can provide to get that kind of ignition. So actually, the fact that the National Ignition Facility, costing billions, has failed, didn't come as a big surprise to people really in the know. That doesn't mean we give up altogether on inertial confinement fusion. There is a variant called fast ignition where you try to separately do the compression and then do the ignition that in principle uses about an order of magnitude less energy. But it has it comes with all kinds of problems of its own. Here is my simple analogy for these two huge programs. In the States, they've built bigger and bigger lasers. In Europe, they built bigger and bigger magnetic bottles. In the run-up to World War II, there were two ways of flying. There were airships, and there were heavier than airplanes. Governments liked funding airships. These huge machines they've been build, the governments have been building, they are like the airships of our time. When World War II finally concentrated everybody's minds, only then did they give up on airships. There are alternatives, but again, for those of you who thought that science ran in an orderly way, an option that has been known about in theory for ages is called Z-pinch. You know that parallel currents attract. Imagine I have a tube of copper, and I pass a big current through it. The tube will suck itself together, and if I put deuterium tritium in the middle, that will compress and potentially ignite the fuel. Now, that's been known about. It didn't seem to work quite well enough. It was two-dimensional compression rather than three-dimensional. Um, here, one of my points, this is a method that is now the leading big method of fusion. Can you read the words? Part of this work was not supported financially but by the families of the authors, and the authors would like to thank them for their forbearance. This is not eccentrics working on the fringe. This is at Sandia Laboratory, one of the US's great national laboratories. This is already famous physicists now regarded as at the front of their field. This is how difficult it is to get a new direction explored when all the official funding is flowing in one direction and there are physicists, politicians directing it. So just as a reminder of how wrong things can go. The solution, a very good solution, and the reason why the blurb to this talk says it's suddenly looking much more promising. It's something so obvious you really feel you should hit yourself over the head for not noticing it immediately. If a magnetic field confines fuel effectively, and inertial confinement also works, what about putting a magnetic field across a fuel capsule that you're going to collapse by inertial confinement? That turns out to work really well because most of you probably know that a superconductor expels magnetic flux. So if this room was surrounded by superconducting walls and ceiling and floor, and we had a magnetic field in here, and we compressed the walls and ceiling and floor inward, as the volume of the room got smaller, the magnetic field would get stronger and stronger. 
Now, at macroscopic scale, you need a superconductor. If you're going to do it very, very fast at microscopic scale, any old conductor would do that isn't time for much dissipation of the eddy currents induced, which are what do the strengthening of the magnetic field to decay away. So, if you're crushing, say, a copper tube, or indeed a beryllium tube they actually used, with a magnetic field already inside it, the magnetic field grows in strength incredibly, even as the density of the fuel that you also wanted to compress grows incredibly. So you've now got dense fuel in an incredibly strong magnetic field that is helping to confine it. As simple as that, they tried it in the computer. It worked very well in the computer. People were impressed, but thought, yeah, we've all seen things work in a computer. But you see some key dates on there. They have done experiments now. They're now as far as getting neutrons. Sandia Z machine. Sandia are the rival great US laboratory to Lawrence Livermore, where they do the National Ignition Facility. Sandia has overtaken them. There's at least one big official method of fusion that really can go to high ratios of power out, for sure. It's still a pretty clumsy way. This woke, have any of you heard of DARPA or ARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency? There are people at Oxford funded by it, and they're very good. They're meant to fund defence stuff, but they love funding stuff that has civilian spin-offs too, like medical spin-offs. ARPA, a month ago, and it's due to for completion just next month, they've announced funding for medium density plasma. They don't say specifically for magnetized target fusion, but for that kind of thing. So the authorities are waking up. I'm no longer saying heretical stuff. They're as good as admitting that the National Ignition Facility with a ridiculous number of lasers or colossal magnetic bottles are not the likely winners. That something cleverer, well, with magnetic fields and inertial confinement, and something called plasmoids. So I will just give some names there for you to Google. There are now quite a few companies looking at these alternative methods of fusion. I'm not talking about cold fusion nonsense. This is all mainstream methods of fusion. They, none of them have shareholders because in every single case, an internet billionaire has popped up and said, I hear you're onto a way of doing fusion. How much money do you need? So in the circumstances, they're being relatively open about their work. I wouldn't bet on all of them. Two of the ones I've listed there, a plasmoid, by the way, let me give you only a very poetic description. Um, you know how in Lord of the Rings films, smoke rings behave like smoke rings ought to behave. You know, they do all kinds of tricks and stay cohesive. A smoke ring in a real atmosphere doesn't do that, it dissipates. Plasmas can be cleverer because you can have an electric current flowing and which actually pulls the stuff together. So I won't try and do three-dimensional diagrams in the air with my hands because there are many different complex configurations, but you can make plasmoids really a bit like wizard smoke rings. Often, a tactic is to collide two plasmoids together. Think Gandalf and Saruman firing smoke rings at one another. You do various twiddles, but you can get high density, high-ish density, not as high as real inertial confinement fusion, but high enough that when you've also got a big magnetic field, you can maybe do fusion. Which of these would you bet on? Well, I don't claim to have a crystal ball, but I am very skeptical that the proton boron methods will work, will work. They require terribly high temperatures, and they don't produce much energy, and you have to be terribly optimistic about things like efficiencies. That means the other methods have a bit of a problem. You have to make sure not only that you can do the fusion, but that you can surround everything with lithium at the moment the fusion is happening. Those two at the bottom there can do that. They're each thinking in terms of smashing a mixture of fluid of lithium and lead around the colliding plasmoids to produce extra pressure and also to catch the neutrons coming off. Those aren't the only alternative methods being tried. An example of proton boron, I've just said I don't really believe proton boron is practical, a device called the Polywell, 
which is fascinating. It's beautiful. You can Google it. But it has to do proton-boron fusion, because otherwise the neutrons will destroy the superconducting coils on which it depends. It failed to do proton-boron fusion, even though the US naval research people invested a lot. They say they're going for deuterium-tritium, but that will never never work, I think. There are better designs of tokamak being tried. There's one called a spheromac, and the University of Washington try Googling for dynamac. That is, again, a bit like a plasmoid. It's inducing the currents you need to contain uh, tokamak, essentially, in the plasma itself. So you don't need massive superconductors around the ring. You actually get currents in the plasma to do the work. Now, if you read their press releases, be warned. They think, they claim, you know, we've solved it, we're ten times smaller and cheaper than ITER, the world can relax. If you actually look at their paper, they're really a lot more cautious. I gather you have done. Um, they admit that they're going into untried plasma regimes in a lot of ways. It might work, but there's a lot of work to be done before you can rely on that. Now, I said I would confine to the last minute or two, like many people, I have my favorite method of fusion. Um, a f another approach is to fire actual mass at very high speed into a small volume to put the energy into the small volume for inertial confinement fusion. People have tried it with iron beams. The trouble is ions repel one another terribly strongly, so you have to neutralize the ions with electrons by sort of firing electrons alongside or something like that, and it doesn't work perfectly. Nobody's got that to work really well yet. Then my method, if you think you've invented something clever, you will discover that 50 years ago, one of the really brilliant Cold War physicists, back when physicists and engineers had untrammeled imaginations, invented it back then when you would have thought that the enabling technology was unfeasibly far away. I have talked to this amazing guy. He's now very old when I say talked by email. He's called Winterberg, Friedwald Winterberg. He has his Wikipedia entry. He proposed 50 years ago what I thought I just invented. If you fire a bullet into a target very, very fast, this is a kind of really simple Tom and Jerry way of getting compression and heating. You can't fire a bullet of the size you need that fast. You only need about a microgram, but there's still no way to fire a microgram at 1,000 kilometers a second or more. Winterberg thought you can, however, fire tiny charged macroscopic pellets, but macroscopic ones, not, not irons, things, you know, a hundredth of a millimeter across, a micrometer across, that kind of thing. You can fire them and make them come together. You can focus them. It's very much as if, imagine I gave you all a rifle and said, shoot that battleship, and you could all fire bullets with such perfect coordination that they came together into a naval shell in midair. Winterberg thought if you do that, you can get the required bullet. Now, he was ahead of his time in several ways. It's now known you have to do some pre-compression first. We can do the pre-compression easily enough, though. And I don't think you can do it with passive focusing, but nowadays you have wonderful enabling technologies, and I have worked some distance on this. We need a variable frequency alternating current accelerator, because DC accelerators have been used to fire microspheres at 100 kilometers a second to test spacecraft meter shields. So this idea of using a modified particle accelerator to fire a charged pellet, not, not new and wild, it works. But you need a variable frequency, alternating current one, to fire a stream of pellets that will all close up together at the speed you need. With devices called MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, you can now cheaply generate variable frequency power at the frequencies you need. We can measure the pellet courses by electromagnetic induction with fast analog to digital converters. We have strong fibers of several sorts available, which can carry a much better charge mass ratio than a sphere. And I'm not going to tell you everything at this moment, because some of it is a little proprietary. One or two of the difficulties are discharging these very highly charged pellets without destroying them. But there's a way to do that. So 
That's just, I said I'd take a minute or so at the end to tell you about my favorite method, and even I have had one of these internet, he's only a multimillionaire, not a billionaire, um, but even I had somebody ferret me out and try to put in money at actually too premature a stage. So the picture I'm trying to give is, all over the world, there's a lot of ways being explored. There's a lot of very smart people funding them, because one thing, you don't get to be an internet billionaire without the ability to tell when technical people are bullshitting you. So I think this is a large part of the reason why the privately funded projects are doing better than the government ones. But if I had to bet, I would bet that far from being 50 years away, you've heard the phrase fusion is 50 years away and always will be. Well, it's much like saying airships are 50 years away and always will be. Yeah, we still don't have practical airships today, and perhaps we never will, but we certainly have practical ways to fly. There are so many ways being tried, it now reminds me more of the Manhattan Project. To get the atom bomb before Hitler, try lots of ways, and not one but several of them will likely succeed. So, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Yes? Um, so, in the end of your talk, you said that you feel that privately funded companies are doing better fusion than the big government ones. Yep. I was wondering if, I guess you could expand a little bit on why you're so pessimistic about Tokamak. Well, essentially, because I don't know if we have anybody from either here tonight or from Cullum. Um, oh, sorry, okay. Um, well, you will know better than me then that there are problems with linings. There are problems you have to, for an operational machine, you'll have to have a meter thickness of lithium or something like Flybe around the reaction site to catch essentially all the neutrons without the superconducting coils being damaged. You're aware that ITER, the battleship sized thing in France, that will produce 500 megawatts, not of output electricity, but 500 megawatts thermal for short bursts. So if it's going to take something that size with unsolved material sciences problems for its lining, to do, you know, to not produce any power out, and costing tens of billions, what scale and cost are we going to need to go to to produce power? You know, I don't claim to have a crystal ball, but I do know, I know people working on the project who have great reservations. I mean, probably you do as well. It's really hard. And if it did work, it would be on a huge, huge expensive scale. Yep? But I guess the point is that there's a machine that is three meters in diameter at Cullum that can produce about 60% of the power that it consumes. Um, it seems like that's far and away better than anything that uh, these startup companies have. Well, well, but it, it's failed to scale. I mean, well, why have jet and ITER, why do they have to be so enormous and so expensive if a small machine is that close? I know, I know what you say is true. The small first tokamaks were even smaller than that. It's appeared tantalizingly close for a very, very long time. But always it's involved being, building a bigger tokamak. I, I mean, I, I am simply making this point. Yeah, you imply, as it were, if you just made it a bit bigger, it would produce power out. Uh, then why did they build JET? Why are they building the enormous ITER? Yeah, so JET was an experiment that produced 60% of power that consumed. Uh, but yeah, but only in a very, as you know, rather specialist sense, thermal, and if you ignore the electricity being consumed by yeah. the laboratory and its supporting equipment. I'm, I'm not saying it's great, I'm just saying that well, um, yeah, we could dispute this, you know, the future is not certain until it happens, but I think personally, and many people certainly think, the tokamaks, that's perhaps the one thing we've invested, we've tried hard enough, we know that's not going to be easy. If there was an easy way to do a tokamak in several hundred design attempts, you know, by a lot of clever people, we would surely have got closer. Any more? No more questions? Okay.
also of course. We've got, we've got refreshments just up, just up the, the stairs. And thank you again all the time. Um, and I hope to see you again soon.